Hi all. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for investing your time with us on Saturday afternoon. I think we are yet to see the viewers. Yeah. Good afternoon, in India. How are you guys? My name is Jitesh, and I'm a Kotlin enthusiast. We are here to start the first session of the series, which we call as a Meet Kotlin, and I'm your host for today. Meet Kotlin, the website that you might have registered through to attend the session. It's a series of webinars conceptualized and executed by Kotlin evangelists and Kotlin user groups in India. Meet Kotlin intends to target the community, which involves students and developers with prior Kotlin experience, Java developers, and possibly some web and iOS developers. The primary goal is to pass on the message that Kotlin can be used for web application development, multi-platform mobile, and backend and server development. Over the course of the time, we shall cover all the technical aspects through the series and help you become a better Kotlin developer. We look forward to hearing your thoughts and suggestions on topics you would want to cover. Please reach out to us at on Twitter handle at the rate meet Kotlin and on the Kotlin Lang Slack.com channel, which is hashtag meet Kotlin. Today's session is all about answering your queries on Kotlin and it's aptly titled The Future of Unified Development. We have some marquee speakers to interact with you today, so ensure that you post your questions in the YouTube live chat window for them. With this, let me introduce our panelists. From JetBrains, we have Svetlana Isakova, developer advocate Kotlin. Svetlana is a member of the Kotlin compiler team and is now a developer advocate for JetBrains. She teaches Kotlin and speaks at conferences worldwide and is also a co-author of the book Kotlin in Action and Atomic Kotlin, which is a new book she is going to publish. Our next panelist is Raghunath Jawahar. He is an independent consultant in Bangalore. Raghunath has helped engineering teams reclaim their legacy code bases, overhaul their architectures, stabilize features, and create engineering roadmaps. His clients include renowned organizations such as Gojek, Tiffany, Glenn Levitt, and several others. And finally, our last panelist, Amrit Sanjeev, developer advocate at Google. Amrit needs no introduction, and most of you would know of him through his technical sessions that he has so enthusiastically conducted for all the community in India. So welcome, panelists. Great to have you with us today. I look forward to an interesting session. Thank you. And I also Hi. want to add that if some of you are not from India, then probably good morning or <laughs> good some other time, because like, for instance, for me now, it's morning. And uh, I'm really happy for this uh, and uh, grateful for these opportunities to actually meet uh, with you all uh, via online without uh, traveling on every possible time. <laughs> this user, so yeah, it's really amazing to be here. Thank you. OK. So now with that, we'll start our panel discussion. As most of you in the audience are waiting to hear from all the experts that we have, Raghunath, Amrit, and Svetlana. Please post your questions on the YouTube. Uh, meantime, I will cover a few of the questions that we have covered from the all over India, outside glo uh, overall from the world, uh, from the Kotlin user groups. Uh, we have compiled a few list of questions that we'll throw in front of our panelists and see uh, how we go forward from there. So first question, Svetlana, to you is, uh, as we all know that Kotlin was initially started in 2011, uh, you guys had internal some small team in JetBrains. What is the vision behind creating a Kotlin? And how do you feel? How is it has in, evolved from so many years? Yeah. Uh, so there are um, mainly uh, the reasons uh, why the Kotlin was created from scratch hasn't changed that much. So there are mainly three. Uh, there were and there are mainly three reasons why uh, the whole this whole. Uh, story uh, started, uh, why it makes sense to invest into Kotlin. At first is um, kind of marketing and brand support for the company itself, for JetBrains. So now more folks know about JetBrains because it's the creator of Kotlin and um, it uh, helps uh, the company. Uh, the second uh, case is uh, we sell tools that support Kotlin. So uh, it, for instance, for Kotlin for source development, it's possible to, to use, then some folks use uh, 
um, uh, community version, community version of Intelligy to develop even server-side applications, but the ultimate version obviously works better and uh, it uh, helps us to sell our main product, our main tools. And Kotlin, uh, of course, it uh, is going to be free and open source and uh, developed by JetBrains and now some, um, and now more and more people from the community. And also uh, the third reason is, and it was important from the start and it's still important now, and now it's even more important, is internal usage for, uh, for JetBrains products. So for instance, right now, Kotlin is used uh, to develop space uh, integrated team environment. So it's a product, a new product. Uh, okay, not that new probably, but a relatively new product by JetBrains. And, and there Kotlin is used full stack. So we can see how Kotlin works, uh, test it ourselves, try it ourselves, and uh, it really boosts the performance. So the development of space wouldn't be possible um, without, without Kotlin, without having one language that is able to be that can be used uh, on every stage of uh, development and this that's really amazing that's really great and um, last but not least uh, in the uh, when uh, at the moment when the quarter was created there was this feeling inside a company that there is a lot of knowledge and experience of supporting different programming languages and there was this wish this idea to use this uh, this experience and uh, kind of um, use it for a good purpose, <laughs> like uh, <laughs> creating this uh, new language that the community uh, can use and, uh, and enjoy. So yeah, that, that okay. are the reasons and they are st all still relevant uh, today. Yeah, that's that's a elaborate answer to it, Svetlana. But one question that people are uh, more focusing or more uh, want to hear is about why the name Kotlin was given to it as a Kotlin. What is the story behind that? There is uh, an island and not far from St. Petersburg, uh, a city when um, lots of JetBrains uh, employees are, are based on. And um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, there was this uh, idea that let's, let's find an island. <laughs> <laughs> so whoever uh, uh, decides to visit this beautiful city of St. Petersburg, uh, first do John Lindman because uh, all other Parts of the year, there's kind of a bit cold there, but in June it's really beautiful. So after, uh, after some time, after, after all this uh, ends and we again can travel, I would, I can really recommend it. It's a beautiful city, and Kotlin is an island not far from it. It's also wow. another city, Kronstadt. It's right there. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, next question, uh, Amrit, to you. Uh, as we heard, Svetlana, that they have added a lot of muscle fuel power to the Kotlin as a pragmatic language, what led Google to a preference to choose and go with Kotlin as a primary class language, first class language for Android mobile development? So it's all the good things about Kotlin. And uh, so things like you can write things really concise. It is making developers really productive uh, in that sense. Uh, not just the code being really concise, it's also the fact that, that those things have ripple effect on the amount of review time you take, the testing time, all these things actually happen. Also, Kotlin has uh, kind of helps you avoid all these uh, common programming mistakes that people were making, right? Where people had to learn all these things through mistakes. Now, Kotlin were, was helping avoid some of those uh, programming problems. Uh, the interoperability between Java, so somebody who was working with Java for a long time, uh, and the learning curve for a Java developer to move over to Kotlin was kind of uh, a very smooth transition over. So all these good features uh, really promoted us. And on top of it, we were getting a lot of developer feedback uh, through our GDE community, the Google Developer Expert community, uh, through customer advisory boards that we run uh, regularly. Uh, for generally, from talking to developers at the conferences, there were a lot of momentum for people, and there were a lot of good things that people were saying about it. And then Google decided to kind of uh, make it a uh, what do you say a primary language for or rather a first class language for android development uh, we also changed a lot of our code base uh, and our apps into kotlin we converted a lot of it that saved somewhere about 30 percent average for us uh, in terms of code size uh, itself and so we've seen the positive benefits in our apps also so all these factors put together led uh, to that decision Okay. I, I, as a personal note, which is your favorite application so far, which has been migrated to Kotlin? And for you, it's been 
uh, enjoyful ride using it performance wise so most of the time we don't realize what all migrated over <laughs> <laughs> you will not see that difference as such from a perspective of uh, because the code base doesn't migrate completely on one completely day. Uh, yeah. so that is another good part of kotlin where you can actually have this mixed code base you have, can have java as well as uh, kotlin uh, code in the same project together and you can migrate uh, I'll migrate what in a very smooth way uh, in yeah. multiple in multiple releases uh, you can convert your code base slowly over to a 100% Kotlin project, or if you want to keep certain things in Java, you can continue to keep it. So that 100% interoperability really does help. Uh, uh, I don't have one favorite as such. The one I guess uh, most of the apps that we use uh, regularly <laughs> at Google right now now in in Kotlin. So uh, I wouldn't yeah. want to pick one over the other. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks for answering that. Uh, moving to the next question, uh, Raghunath, um, as you heard Amrit also saying that Google had a lot of thought process behind making Kotlin as a first class language for Android development uh, because of its pragmatic features, which Svetlana spoke about. Uh, how do you see uh, Kotlin uh, adoption in the server development world? OK, uh, so that's a, that's a good question. And uh, before I confine my answer just to server development, I want to talk a little bit about um, how Kotlin can not only be used in mobile or server, but also uh -huh. other, right? Okay. Um, so when we talk about uh, like building solutions, right? Like software developers tend to build solutions. And uh, one thing that I notice is when you're trying to build for a different platform, uh, there's a learning curve that you have to sort of cross, right? Like say, for example, a mobile developer, uh, if they want to go develop for the web, they have to cross a learning curve. And uh, what I tend to think of software is these are solutions that are expressed through mediums, right? Like the, the medium could be Android or iOS or backend or front end, right? So these are different things. And when you're looking at the learning itself, uh, first is like you have to have a good understanding of the medium, right? Mobile or backend, right? And then probably you also have to understand about the framework and possibly a mental model associated with the framework. And then there is a language that you may or may not have to learn. And then there is an ID that goes along with the language, right? So when you look at like trying to build for a different, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, medium, then uh, the learning curve itself is so huge, right? Yeah. But then uh, when you take a language like Kotlin, right? Probably you still have to learn the medium because if you're a mobile developer and if you're trying to build RESTful APIs, you have to understand the conventions of the RESTful APIs, right? Probably if you're trying to build front end, you should probably be able to pick up React and React comes with a certain mental model, right? Correct. So that learning curve is still there. But then when you have a language like Kotlin, which has like a lot of tooling support and also has like a lot of support in the uh, community, uh, you don't really have to like learn the language in the ID itself, right? So which means uh, uh, teams that operate with a startup mindset, uh, mm -hmm. which means even enterprises that have smaller teams, they can sort of like bring in very few number of developers who know Kotlin and then they can sort of go ahead and build things in whatever medium they want. See, it wouldn't be hard for a mobile developer to go and build mobile, uh, sorry, backend APIs, right? Mm -hmm. So this can give a strategic advantage to the team itself, right? Like, because personally, I've been using uh, Kotlin to build uh, not only mobile applications, but also uh, backend and uh, developer tools that run on the CLI or like a backend application uh -huh. around a Docker image, right? Okay. Um, and also companies tend to build internal portals, like the ones that your business or a product managers may need. So all of these things, when you have like a language like Kotlin, it gives a very good strategic advantage because you can do things really quickly, right? Correct. Yeah. And uh, not only when you are like operating at a startup mindset, uh, if you decide to scale up, right? Like one of the reasons what like startup uh, teams with startup mindset tend to do is to pick technologies that allow them to iterate really fast and like move very fast, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and these languages and frameworks sometimes and and most of the times they tend to give you this initial velocity where you tend to move like really really fast, but then the moment you start adding like two, three, or five more developers, then all the initial velocity that you got like sort of like goes away, right? Because you mm -hmm. have a different set of problems to deal with. But Kotlin being uh, uh, like the way how Kotlin uses type inference, you still get uh, the capabilities of a dynamically typed language, like 
there's like not a lot of it's not very verbose it's very concise so that mm-hmm. initial velocity you can maintain that velocity even if you tend to hire even more developers to the team so i, I think like kotlin as a language can uh, be uh, strategically uh, uh, used as an advantage for uh, small and you know, larger teams alike okay just to add on to that particular answer it, it was really insightful raghunath as you mentioned rightly that it helps not only in catching up with the velocity to have the same language across the multi platforms mobile back end or a web and also for the enterprises also it has an advantage a strategic advantage to go with the language which offers multiple verticals but f- from the server development uh, which is the preferred framework that you see it's easy to adopt easy to migrate or it has a good scalability related solutions and features to support uh, i'm 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 moving towards kate or micronaut or a vertex that we have i can i can just uh, answer that that there is no one <laughs> there is no preferred <laughs> framework and uh, kotlin works great for sp- for instance with spring so if you're already spring developer and you uh, you, you see advantages of kotlin there are lots of them uh, so you can just uh, add Kotlin to your existing uh, framework, so or your existing application. So there is no need to switch. We don't think that if it already works, you should change it to this. If you have some issues, you can. But there is no, and also there is Cater that first uh, mm, f- uh, first class Kotlin that is developed having Kotlin in mind. So mm-hmm. it uh, uses the full power of Kotlin, but to say okay. so, it's uh, your choice if you. Thinking, if if you probably know Kotlin, if you if you don't have preferences for any other frameworks, you can just try it. And also, there are many other frameworks, and uh, they all can uh, have their use cases. They all have their like pros and cons. So it's uh, totally up to you. But Kotlin just works uh, with all with, with all of them. <laughs> so that's it. Okay. So there uh, is no preferred oh. way of going towards any framework. But yeah, it's based yes, on the requirement yes, so like and me, how it suits you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so I think that Spring and Cater are the, like the first options, uh, okay. depending on your use case. But it's not limited to that. There are many frameworks, and they all work uh, really well. And also speaking about server side adoption, I wanted just to share one link. I think mm-hmm. that I can share it uh, with a um, private chat that, that can be shared uh, here. So else is just a list of companies, service uh, like case studies. Uh, for service side development, the companies that already use uh, Kotlin for their development with their stories. So sometimes there are links to external resources, sometimes it's uh, something published on the Kotlin website. Mm, so you can Google uh, Kotlin server side uh, case studies or just use this link. And there you can see h- how many companies are already adopting and what uh, they say, because I think that the word not from us, but from folks who already use it is uh, <laughs> most important. Yeah. So of course we can say, yeah, yeah, use Kotlin, but I think that uh, sharing the real experience of real folks who use it and like it and what problems uh, have they um, get, if any. So it's it's it's, it's really useful. So I, I really recommend uh, to check this link. And by the way, if you are already developing Kotlin uh, for server side or uh, multi platform, mm-hmm. just uh, th- you'll find the way. Like if you want to publish your story, there is the way to contact us and uh, we publish uh, greatly okay. your story as well. There. Great. I I, I was hope I was moving towards that question that if somebody wants to publish their own case studies, then what is the process? You just answered it. Uh, that's great. Raghunath, any any uh, somebody anything that you would like to add on top of this? Uh, not really, Jitesh. OK, cool. So uh, we heard about uh, moving towards uh, the usage of the Kotlin where enterprises are as a solutioning uh, or as a strategic language that we all see, right? So Amrit, uh, my question to you is like, um, what about mobile? Like we have a bunch of other languages for cross platforms, right? Like we have React Native or Flutter, right? Uh, which helps in developing iOS and Android, um, especially React Native, which is only the one language where we compile uh, and have executables in iOS in Android with same same lang- code base. But how does Kotlin contribute or challenge the ecosystem uh, of having a cross-platform mobile solutioning? And we also have a Kotlin multi-platform which has come into a play. So how do you overall see to this particular ecosystem on the cross-platform uh, mobile apps? 
Okay, uh, full disclaimer, I still do most of my work on the native side of things. My exploration on the cross-platform development is more of academic reasons, and I just wanted to understand the tech uh, behind it. So uh, I'll, I'll uh, please feel to chime in uh, if, if there are more points that you want to add. Uh, the other panelists should uh, chime in. Uh, my thoughts around it is that I think most frameworks have their pros and cons. Uh, a cross-platform development was something that uh, enterprises and uh, companies have been trying to get through and uh, kind of master uh, for quite a long time. And there were early frameworks which weren't as successful as uh, uh, the ones we have right now. Uh, React uh, Native was the one where this really started picking up uh, and a lot of companies started adopting it for, for reasons uh, we all know. Uh, it, it had and because of that it has a large community uh, there's also a lot of a uh, lot of libraries that are there for it and uh, it's built up that reputation for it it has a lot wider adoption that's what i i mean because it came in a little earlier uh, in the pipeline uh sometimes i've heard i mean this is from others that i've heard uh sometimes performance can be a little tricky to kind of manage it. Uh, and it's not in every case certain cases it is a little too little difficult or a little more uh, challenging to manage yeah. the home, sort of a platform uh, and uh, uh, but uh, again there's a lot of help out there so there is pros and cons for it uh, with uh, Kotlin multi-platform uh, uh, the fact that you can write business logic uh, and then uh, compile it into multiple platforms is definitely something that uh, excites people uh, there's a lot yeah. of interest around this one and I've been following what JetBrains have been doing with uh, <laughs> uh, Kotlin multi-platform for quite some time. And I'm quite excited about it, to be very honest. Uh, and uh, the fact that some of this, uh, there's a lot of potential there in terms of actually getting onto platforms which are beyond just JVM uh, own. Uh, and I think that is, uh, in, in, in its own way, uh, 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 Kotlin multi-platform has its advantages in that sense. Uh, uh, for a reusability part of it and all those aspects. Uh, one uh, thing that I've noticed uh, when I compare both of this is sometimes for fast iterations, uh, this is again, uh, my personal opinion, uh, very personal opinion, and please feel free to uh, challenge that uh, uh, if, if you feel it's not right. Uh, but as I said, uh, the fast prototyping uh, React sometimes gets a lot of uh, React, some people tend to choose React, uh, React Native, and then uh, for a full-fledged project, a lot of people tend to, uh, when things are more clear and it's not an MVP sort of a thing, a lot of people tend to choose Kotlin multi-platform. A slightly larger team, uh, yeah. see all these record to multi-platform, are there a slightly larger team? It could be just because the problems they solve are bigger. Uh, I don't know, I don't have a very different answer for it, but these are some of the comparisons that I, I can actually put across. Uh, nice. from my experience talking to people. Yeah. But I leave it to the other panelists who might have worked. <laughs> yeah, I actually can just agree with that. So, and there's, uh, I think the, you know, there was this um, uh, idea about uh, React Native that is great for, for start when you just start developing it, but then uh, when your application grows and grows and probably comes from, I don't know, transforms from a startup to a product <laughs> that you sell and you have a big audience, it's, it's, it became more and more difficult because you don't have native access to the platform. And that is exactly the issue that Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile wants to solve. So it wants to provide the way to, to share the code, share the business logic, but to be able to access the native platform API at the same time. So you still uh, can write like UI for microOS on Swift to write to, to mm -hmm. um, create UI for Android and Pure Kotlin. So you, you, you don't need to, to use about this common functionality. So it's mostly, it's, it's very, it has a very specific uh, use case, a very mm -hmm. big target to share this business logic. And that is mostly, uh, important for bigger, bigger teams, bigger applications, and that 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 is how it works. So it's like if you uh, if you plan to if if you uh, want to, to create fast prototype to uh, to pro prove of concept that you just want to create uh, something to make something work really fast, then probably some other solution can work better for you. But if you have in mind a bigger team, like conquering mm -hmm. the world and, <laughs> and uh, expanding your application, then it might uh, might make sense to even start if, with it from scratch. Yeah, but it right. really depends on this case. Yep. Okay. Thanks for elaborating that, uh, Amrit and Svetlana. 
I, I will just circle back to the previous discussion uh, that we were having related to the um, enterprises and the startups, uh, as Raghunath, you mentioned, right? Uh, do you still feel that enterprises somewhere at some certain point, they are reluctant to adopt to this particular language? Or do you see any huge learning curve involved or a baggage towards the existing implementation? How, how do you address it? How do you consult them? How do you encourage them to make that happen? OK, uh, so first thing, if you have any concerns about the learning curve itself, I would say, uh, if you are a Java developer, uh, picking up Kotlin is not going to be very difficult. I, I think like it probably takes people like a couple of days to understand the existing syntax and then like get like be very productive uh, with Kotlin itself, right? So uh, I still remember the very first time I tried Kotlin uh, when the uh, it was like not even but it, it was not even version one. I think this was back in 2015. So I was able to pick up Kotlin in like a couple of days. And uh, that's because the language is very, very uh, similar uh, in terms of semantics when it comes to Java. But then uh, it's also very uh, simple for anyone to understand and pick up, right? And you'll probably be uh, uh, not writing idiomatic Kotlin for a few weeks or months, but then uh, picking up a language and using it uh, in your day-to-day -day work shouldn't be a problem at all, right? And uh, when you talk about uh, adoption itself, I, I guess like this is someone like a, a developer who wants to like help the teams adopt. So uh, when talking, when speaking about adoption, the first thing that I try to understand is like uh, to identify who my stakeholders are, right? Say for example, uh, it's probably being going to be developers that I'm going to work with, right? And then the next thing is uh, the manager or the decision making authority who is going to authorize the use of a certain technology. And then third would be probably other team members who are consuming uh, the modules that I built, right? right. So uh, first thing that I would uh, recommend developers do is to sort of incite uh, curiosity, like make it like a very less formal thing, probably build something playful and then show it to your co co-workers or like say 10, try to parallel implement a parallel implementation of a controller mm -hmm. in your application and then show it to your Hello, developers, right? Because when you show these things, and then when people can see these comparisons side by side, it tend to ex it tends to excite them, right? So I, I think mm -hmm. like that one person pitching or vouching for a new language to be adopted, uh, it makes them a lot more sense to have many people to uh, uh, you know sort of like share the same kind of enthusiasm, right? Um, so because this is very important because the manager who is going to uh, authorize the use of this language, right, in enterprises. Uh, that person would be more comfortable when you have like several developers, like maybe at least three or four people vouching for a language and like helping other team members rather than you being one single person and pitching for the language itself, right? And uh, the other thing that I would like sort of uh, uh, recommend is to have learning materials that are, I think there's like no dearth of learning materials. You have like enough documentation for Kotlin and then it's only getting added more and more, right? So right. the other thing, uh, for your company, if your company uses a very specific kind of technology, probably have very little tutorial or documentation showing people how to do get going, right? Like how do you create a REST endpoint, right? Or like how do you create a simple UI in an Android application, right? So I think like those are the things that you may have to know so that your team, your because your manager expects you to set the team, rest of the team for success, right? So when you have enough materials, I think like the conversation becomes more uh, easier to have. And uh, when it comes to other concerns, you can still, uh, you know, talk because like if you're targeting the JVM platform, you get the same benefits as the JVM ecosystem, right? So uh, auditing Kotlin for uh, security issues or other concerns in the organization should not be that big of a problem because we are building on top of like we are still uh, uh, exist. Uh, sorry, leveraging uh, the existing um, well-proven JVM ecosystem. All right. Yeah, and as Svetlana also mentioned about the use case uh, and the case yeah, studies. I just right? wanted to add that this from our side, <laughs> the thing that we uh, do internally is publishing and collecting and publishing, making them open this all these use cases, all these case studies of the company. So again, my request goes to you. <laughs> if Especially if you're a well-known company in India or in your region, it will be real, we will really appreciate if we can share your story. Because right. it, it that's what makes other folks, other people uh, pick up the technology and especially like it's it's also important for different regions because in this case people can come to you, can ask questions, can probably uh, have direct contact. So we uh, we we are really really keen to see the idea, we really like, uh, go yeah. to this direction. 
Thanks. Just to add to what the other panelists mentioned, uh, one of the mm-hmm. things I, uh, with the companies that I've worked with, uh, uh, what we've uh, been telling is to set realistic expectations. Uh, you are taking in a new tech. Uh, there is okay. definitely productivity improvement, but that is not going to be like day one. Uh, you don't want to jump in and commit on something that you can't deliver and then uh, make up, get yourself into trouble. So it's also the fact that uh, set realistic expectations uh, with the case studies and things like that show climate benefits and uh, clearly helping the manager understand the risks because sometimes the risks are, they don't right. see the risks or they don't assess the risk clearly. For them, any change is a risk. Uh, right. So having all these case studies, we give it to them, uh, helping them understand and maybe under committing and over delivering for a few times yeah. uh, would definitely help you get the confidence in. Uh, I've seen places where people say, oh, we're going to half the, uh, the development time. And uh, the first build, no, not really, because there are going to be quirks that you will find. Uh, there will be things that everybody in the team needs to adjust to. So yeah. plan for those things also. Uh, realistically, in the real world projects, uh, I mean, there will be but definitely there will be productivity improvements. Uh, but uh, you want to be setting a realistic expectation to somebody who can't judge it from a pure technical perspective. Yeah, that's that's a really helpful tip. Um, as now uh, we were speaking about these challenges, right, about the adoption. Uh, so Amrit, what's your take on giving a tips or a pitfalls that somebody, uh, a developer who is coming from a Java or a JavaScript background and mm-hmm. wants to start out in a Kotlin for Android, what, what would you suggest to them from where they need to start? Yeah, I mean, uh, so the learning curve, like I said, you you really want to leverage on the cross uh, interoperability part of it. Don't try to convert your entire code into this. Uh, uh, set realistic expectations of how you want to do it. A lot of the companies that I work to the top uh, unicorns in, on, in our startup world right now, uh, as part of my regular day job, uh, they all have moved it incrementally. They, they, most of them come to a point where they would set, maybe rewrite a certain part of a module or any new file they write or any new code they write, they would actually move it. And then they would go create, work on the backlog and slowly move the code uh, more and more into code. And, and then what you have a lot of interoperability. But from a developer's perspective, two things that I clearly want to highlight for new developers. One is uh, writing concise code versus writing readable code. Uh, sometimes people think of expertise as being more concise. So the expert will write more concise. Uh, so I have to write it in the shortest, smallest. Kotlin gives you a lot of facility. Really yeah. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, you want to think of the next person who's going to read it. Uh, exactly. That sometimes really shoots yourself in the foot where you yourself cannot read it six months from <laughs> six months after you wrote it. You don't want to really write things like that. So readability, just balance the readability versus memory. Uh, yeah. that, that's what a little more. Uh, and the other thing that I've seen where developers over engineer is uh, trying to treat null like it's like a villain in a movie. Uh, you really want to completely avoid it. So you create types over types over types. So null is perfectly okay. Uh, it's not <laughs> not like this villain. It, it, yes, there is null point exception is bad, but null in itself is not a bad concept. So where yeah. they absolutely need it, you should uh, leverage using that uh, and and uh, work with it rather than try to over engineer and work against. Uh, and uh, there are certain things in Kotlin for, for Java developers, like things like uh, extension functions. A lot of people don't really continue to, continue, or rather don't exploit or leverage on that uh, particular functionality because they continue to write code like they were doing in Java. And, yeah, yeah. They just, uh, because a lot of the code uh, people start off in Android, they use the existing migration tool to do that, which does not really do this part. This is more of styling, right? So mm-hmm. uh, uh, not styling, it's, it's, it's refactoring, but then the code would just convert it to Kotlin code. Uh, and writing better code involves maybe using seal classes, extension functions, these sort of additional uh, functionality and uh, really cool features that the language provides. Uh, try to take advantage of that. Uh, don't keep yourself away from it uh, because they will definitely help. And it requires a little bit of thinking change for the developer, like how they think about structuring their code and, and how they write code. That jump is definitely something people have to do, understand, and do. Uh, don't avoid doing that in your code because it just does not help. I mean, uh, in my opinion, you're not leveraging on, on yeah. the best benefits of the platform uh, if you're not. And lastly, synchronization. 
uh, this whole core core routine. I mean, there's tons of videos out there for it, but then synchronization as such is much more easier. But do not skip studying the basics of it. Hmm. How does it work under the hood? Please do understand yeah, synchronization. That's an important tip. Yep. Yes, it, it's not about how well you are, know to use the library that lets you stitch things together. It also is about understanding how this works under the hood a lot. Yep. Uh, and that part is also a little bit skipped. And the, the syntactic sugar is not something that you want to really focus on. Yes, it's important, uh, but not only that. You really want to also focus a little more of what's happening under the hood. That's when you really com can compare and contrast between different libraries or different approaches. And that definitely, as you uh, progress in your career as an engineer, you really will need to do some of these things. So uh, yes, do take care of that aspect. I mean, those are my tips uh, for things that come to my mind. I'm sure uh, it will help to the engineers who are trying to migrate from Java or a JavaScript background and want to start on a Kotlin path. So obviously, these tips will be helpful. Uh, next question, Svetlana, to, to you is like, uh, if uh, there is a developer who has a background in JavaScript and recently JavaScript using Kotlin, Kotlin JS is gaining ground. So uh, as a JavaScript developer, they think that already their code in JavaScript has been interpreted in the browser itself. Then why should we bring Kotlin into the mix? Uh, so first of all, uh, to answer this question, we have this Kotlin JS backend. That means you can, uh, like, for, as for Kotlin, the it actually has three different backends. You can compile Kotlin code to JVM, and also there are some specialities for Android, of course. But also, you can choose to compile your Kotlin code to either JavaScript or to Kotlin or, or to native binaries for LLVM. So I think here we are speaking primarily about Kotlin JS experience. So you can write Kotlin code uh, and run it in the browser as is. <laughs> so via this Kotlin JS ba uh, backend. And uh, the question might be like, why one would like to do that? Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's, that's a very valid question. And at first, I want to say that if you're just a JavaScript developer and you are already using like some tools, some infrastructure, and you're a front-end developer, then um, my personal advice would be if you use pure JavaScript, my personal advice would mm -hmm. be to look into some statically type languages. Because uh, this difference going from dynamic type language to static type mm -hmm. language, that what changes the picture and that brings lots of improvements. And mm -hmm. then I, I can't give a can't give a good answer. Like, why would one pick Kotlin JS over TypeScript? Probably in many use cases, TypeScript will be just a good choice. So it's like we don't want to uh, replace it for uh, for those folks who are purely front-end developers, purely JavaScript developers. However, there is an, another important use case. Kotlin allows you to use uh, the same language for the full stack. Yeah. With Kotlin, you can write uh, your front end uh, parts in your front end in Kotlin in Co and uh, run it in the browser, and also the back the server the back end logic also in Kotlin and compile to Kotlin JVM. And what's more, you can also share some parts between these. So, for instance, it might be really useful for sharing business model. You can define the same classes, the same mm. basic structure in Kotlin and compile it separately to Kotlin JVM and Kotlin JS and use just the same classes, the same common model. And yeah. that, that works, so that's really beneficial. And I think that it is the main reason why one would like to, to use like uh, to use Kotlin JS. It is uh, this whole the whole story. Or an alternative if you already know Kotlin and you want to write something for the for web, for browser, you can just pick up the language uh, that you already know. In this case, also Kotlin is a is a great choice. Cool. And uh, speaking about this Kotlin, Kotlin full stack experience, I've already mentioned it. We have space project uh, inside JetBrains, and it is indeed full stack Kotlin. So it's it uses Kotlin for all the right. possible uh, backends, all the possible means. So it it uh, represents uh, it's like a really good proof of concept of this idea, and we are going to share more stories. It's like they're already there, so like if you can you can check out the conf uh, video. I think yeah, the last conf uh, video. There are some. Uh, there is a talk about how space is used, and we are going to also share like more stories, more materials about it. 
Nice. So I would say that this is the main use case for for Kotlin chess. Yeah, uh, and just to add on to that, uh, the meetkt.org website that we have built, it's based on the Kotlin JS. It has a Ktor backend in the hood. Uh, we will be planning soon to make it open source or not. That is something that we'll decide with the community and the Kotlin user groups. But yeah, uh, the experience of using Kotlin JS was nice. Um, but we still see. Uh, if JetBrains can promote a good amount of material on Kotlin JS, unlike like we have Ktor and KMM, uh, or the use case studies around Kotlin JS will bring on more JavaScript developers to adapt to it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. right now we are currently focused on this, like to make our life easier. <laughs> right now we're <laughs> first focused on this, uh, uh, like nice. Kotlin. You, uh, case studies for this uh, service side, but yeah, that's of course on our list for for some future time. Yeah. Cool. Uh, now moving towards the uh, uh, end of the uh, the main questions that we had from the KUGs group, right? Uh, we do have this kind of questions always come up that engineers, developers, they see that there is a good amount of plethora of features that Kotlin has to offer, right? Uh, but in your opinion, let's say there are sealed classes, final classes, non liability feature, but what are the features that you feel are being exploited today and what you would recommend for that? Do you see uh, any kind of such exploitation happening from the engineers so of the community? I would say that uh, the, my, my first um, choice would be not about exploitation by the community, but probably uh, about um, not the best desire <laughs> from uh, the Kotlin team in the first hand. And uh, there's uh, no issue for many. It's uh, uh, position destructuring for data class. What it means in Kotlin, you can define a class, uh, a data class in a very short manner. You just define a class and its properties. And there is a syntax uh, that allow you to uh, to assign instance of a data class into several variables based on their positions. And uh, it works great for simple, especially library classes like pair or triple or some others, but it does work that well with uh, community defined uh, classes. And uh, there might be really hard to, to catch bugs if you add a new property into this data class somewhere in the middle, hmm. that destruction stops to work. It's a, a known issue. We are thinking of how to address it, probably allowing this name destructuring or something else. So it's it's on <laughs> it's a known issue. But uh, so okay. far, I would just uh, recommend either not to use this feature completely or to uh, or to mm -hmm. Like only use this uh, this feature if you kind of don't expect your data class to change because it's a very simple one and uh, and it won't change. But uh, in all other use cases, just don't, don't <laughs> use it. Uh, yes, um, a known feature. Uh, known thing. Another um, another thing that I uh, can mention here is uh, assumption that uh, you you hear that yeah, Kotlin frees you from null pointer exception, <laughs> and uh, you, there is uh, there are nullable types and uh, they just work. You don't need to uh, to be bothered about it. However, if you mix Kotlin with Java, and it works also if you just use some Java library, some Java API, uh, there are, might still be null pointer exceptions because Java types are interpreted as regular hmm. Java types. So this nullability rules doesn't apply to them. I cover in the Coursera course uh, the details, or I had a talk at some point. Uh, I, uh, these details, so it's like there, is, there are a lot of materials. I will I will share one uh, link, uh, link for each sure. of the Coursera course, but uh, there are many uh, ways uh, to learn it. And that is just something that you better know. Uh, so, like, whenever you mix this Kotlin Java project, uh, just check this um, these ideas. Like, uh, there is this reasoning, so it's uh, also it, it it's based of on pragmatism. It's a pragmatic choice uh, why it works like this. But some people might be surprised. Like, yeah, you promised me no, and yes, and now there is one. Cool. So we have uh, two more couple of minutes uh, before we go into Q and A session from the audiences. Uh, anything, uh, Raghunath Amrit, you want to add on top of this? the exploitation of the Kotlin features. OK. Uh, tell like a few things that I uh, I personally feel or like th these are my opinions about the language itself, right? So one thing uh, I'm slightly uncomfortable is with the force unwrap operator, which is like the double <laughs> bank operator, right? So whenever I find someone using this, it feels like, you know, someone shot themselves in the food. 
<laughs> so one thing that I one thing one thing that I like is uh, when we are dealing with a null level type and when you are force unwrapping it, which means there is some assumption, right? So I would always recommend someone to have a check before they use this operator and also probably add logging to the call, right? So that way, since the code is constantly evolving, the assumptions assumptions with which we are force unwrapping this uh, uh, variable or field could no longer be true, right? So that is one thing that I find, uh, uh, you know, sort of... Um, Just don't uh, use it. <laughs> don't use it. <laughs> Yeah, don't use it. Yeah, like so. I tend to like sort of. Uh, there are there are uh, lint rules that you can apply to not use these things. So sometimes, depending on context, I tend to use the option type uh, or use a seal class with the null object pattern, right? Like that really depends on the boundaries. So if you are going to deal with null values from external systems, that's where most of the context is lost, right? So this is where you can sort of model your null values into appropriate uh, seal class representations, right? Uh, the other thing. Uh, uh, is about uh, what do you call it? Uh, people not specifying the return type of a function. Uh, I know like function expressions are there and Kotlin allows it, but just because a function takes two integers as input doesn't mean um, it would return an integer as an output, right? So uh, I, I personally feel that uh, conciseness, like code should be written for readability. We should optimize for readability over writing, right? So uh, always specify your return type. Uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And uh, the other language feature uh, that I'm slightly wary up about is uh, using the late in it uh, uh, keyword. Because uh, when you say late in it, what you're saying is I want this field or property to be non-null, but then you cannot access it until a certain point in time, right? Like that could probably be a setter or an initializer function that will put a value inside this latent field, right? Mm -hmm. So I think like when people use this function, they uh, they I I would probably recommend not to uh, try to avoid it as much as you can unless the framework forces you to do it, because uh, now this knowledge is lost because some other developer who is going to maintain the code sometime in the future has to know this information, right? And they probably will not know it until you run into a exception during runtime, right? Uh, so probably try to you not construct the object at all until the dependent uh, dependency is available, right? But then um, in terms of Android where some uh, objects are only available du during certain lifecycle methods, this is unavoidable. But in other cases, this is something that you have to be wary about uh, using it. Yeah, it's a, it's a uh, great thought. It's a great thought, Raghu. Thanks. Thank you. Can uh, I just we have... add to the yeah. explicit types that there is also this explicit API mode, so you actually can enforce the compiler to uh, to make you specify all the types explicitly. Uh, mostly, it's designed for library authors, but if you share this idea that uh, it's like you better enforce it, there is this help from the compiler. But generally, I agree. I would I would just say that I, I think it's fine if your function just returns either a string. So it's like obvious that it's string, like it's just string literal. So in this case, probably the type can be omitted. But in any case, more complicated than that, it's better to to, to just specify okay. this return uh, types. Cool. Uh, so I, yeah. I just want to reinforce the readability part of it. I come back to it all the time, uh, and also styling. I mean, uh, one of the things that uh, in the code bases that I've seen where a lot of developers do work, it's hard uh, when they are starting to work. Uh, it's not when they are set into a rhythm, but when they're starting to work with Kotlin, the styles in which they write don't really match. So in one project, you'll have the same thing done in different ways. Uh, and that, again, following a consistent style, which is which again makes it readable, uh, and your code review cycles will be much better, uh, and the reiteration just reduces. So those are things that I would, I would, I mean, those are the I, I've encountered a lot. So maybe I, uh, I'm a little biased about it, but yeah, I'm, I'm a huge, Huge proponent, uh, huge fan of good readable code. Uh, so I'll come back to saying that 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 is not being taken care enough. Uh, at least uh, like this concise versus the readability uh, debate is always there <laughs> among developers. So I don't know how it got in, but it, it somehow feels like a measure of expertise for people. The more concise you write, the big, better expert you are. I, mean, I don't I don't believe that it's true, but then I, I think it's like a unsaid uh, rule among developers that they're trying to do that. Uh, yeah, that's something that needs to be broken a bit more. And we also have this. Uh, there, there was this exact this uh, concern that there are many different style guys. So at one point we tried to gather 
Um, so it doesn't cover lots of opinionated topics. So it's, it tries to be as opinionated as possible. So if you want to, if you like to argue about cost trials, you still have, you still have the freedom to do it on unimportant matters. But at least uh, this style get published on our site should solve uh, some of your concerns. So we try to, to gather this information and to publish it. So please, please check it uh, before battle link, <laughs> and then you can continue with that link. Cool. So uh, we have uh, 10 more minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Let's say if we want to extend more five minutes, but we have a bunch of Q and A's coming from the audience on the YouTube. Uh, the first question, Svetlana, is related to the uh, Kotlin multi-platform. Uh, it says that Kotlin docs, the Kotlin multi-platform does not support JVM, server JVM targets and combination of JVM plus Android. Is there a plan to add those options like unsupported combinations in Kotlin multi-platform. Uh, there are some, so it's like, as I understand, it's not about the docs, it's there are some issues that uh, needs to be fixed to make it properly work that are, and uh, if, you, if you check uh, the whole Heracle uh, multi-platform story was, uh, was about it. So I think that the, uh, there, or do you mean like samples or something? Because I think that uh, this, the configuration are covered. Uh, so I, I, uh, I, I can't uh, I can't really that uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, there should be some uh, further okay. discussion. Yeah. Maybe if uh, can somebody rephrase the question, whoever has posted it, uh, we'll try to take it up. Uh, moving to the next question, Amrit, uh, it says that are there any plans to introduce building UI elements for the web, like how it's done on Android with Jetpack Compose? Are there any plans in terms of, uh, I mean, are we talking about Google releasing something? <laughs> I mean, if that is the case, I can't say anything which is <laughs> My mouth is sealed about that one, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, no worries, so no worries. That's uh, the future plans out here. Uh, okay. Unless okay. it's there on the website. I, I, <laughs> okay, that's how Amrit answers the question. So whoever has questioned that. Being uh, safe. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And so we Tana, did some experiment with Jetpack, uh, with Compose for desktop inside JetBrains. So it's like very much prototyping and stuff, but still you can, you can check it, how it uh, works. Yeah, uh, someone is asking, I'm working on a banking application and we take app security very seriously. Can I still use Kotlin and does Kotlin have any security related features? Nothing specific here. It's like everything that you have already on JVM works for you. So it's uh, it's like an easy answer to many, many questions already covered in the JVM ecosystem that it's like you can reuse all the, all the things that are already available. And maybe uh, you and Raghunath can answer this question. Um, it says, uh, why Kotlin classes are kept as final by default? Can you throw some light on this decision? Why JetBrains thought of, or Kotlin framework team thought of having the final classes by default? OK. Um, I think Svetlana can answer like more, but I'll give you a couple of cents on this. <laughs> So I, I think Kotlin is itself a multi-paradigm language, right? Like it uh, allows you to write programming uh, in an object-oriented way, or if you want to do it in a functional way, you can still go ahead and do it, right? And one of the aspects of functional programming is it makes multi-threading easy. And for you to have uh, uh, like code that can be easily run in parallel, it has to be immutable, right? So immutability by default is a philosophy if you want to go ahead and do functional programming, right? And, the, and also in, uh, uh, immutability uh, uh, makes your code a lot more predictable. Like you can start using pure functions and things like that, right? Uh, so that's one of the reasons why everything in uh, Kotlin is uh, default. Uh, it, it's final by default, your classes are default and your uh, very, you have separate uh, collections for mutable and immutable uh, structures like lists and map, right? So I think that's, sorry? Read only. <laughs> read only, yeah, read only. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah read only. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that that's, that's the reason why Kotlin uh, is immutable by default. And also, I think like Kotlin also doesn't favor mutability. That's why even when you type var, uh, if you look at the IDE, you, you will see that your uh, field names are like underlined, which means like it's 
drawing your attention and doesn't look really pretty on the screen, right? And that's also uh, Jet, JetBrains' way of nudging developers in a direction where you, you favor immutability over mutability. Okay. Um, we lost Svetlana, but uh, let's let's move on to the next question. Uh, Raghunath, uh, this is for you. Is there a way to use a Kotlin in data engineering? Uh, say, for an example, with the Spark framework. Any idea on that? Uh, not really. I haven't had much experience with data science. But then wherever you can use the JVM platform, you can use Kotlin as a drop-in, and then you can use it there as well. Correct, correct. Yeah. Hey, Svetlana, you are back. Yeah, I'm, I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, Svetlana, there was uh, one more question related to uh, Kotlin multi-platform. Uh, it's from the Windows community. Uh, they are saying that Kotlin native examples, interop guides, etc., are missing for Windows platform. Uh, is JetBrains taking any efforts uh, to support that? Like, my team has adopted Kotlin multi-platform for Android, iOS, and Mac, but Windows developers are struggling. Yeah, but you know, you need a Mac OS to develop uh, iOS apps. So it's like uh, fundamental. It's, a, it's, it's a limitation of the OS, yeah. <laughs> and we can do nothing about it. Another question for you, uh, Svetlana, is that um, since uh, the beginning of the Kotlin, right? Um, and last year, we have seen that Kotlin has come away along with 1.4 major release in last year, August. And then we have been seeing some incremental periodic releases, uh, September, November, December. So what is the biggest surprise or a thing that has been added or it's been used that you didn't expect in the beginning? And now you are most proud or excited about? I can just share what I'm excited about uh, from the coming uh, changes, from the coming, uh, from things that the team is working on right now. Uh, and I think that the first thing will be uh, the story of Recompiler. Uh, I think we've shared it several times during uh, the GotenConf keynotes. And uh, we've, um, uh, yeah, and uh, got, uh, some parts are already available. So since, for, for instance, Kotlin 1.4 comes with new type inference algorithm. Uh, also, you can try, you can use under flex uh, JVM and JS new backends that reuse some internal representation. So it, there is a lot of a lot going on inside uh, Kotlin team to actually to rewrite the Kotlin compiler. And the last, uh, but probably the most important part will come later, which is new front end, and uh, it promises a really good speed up for for uh, code compilation. And uh, I, I I find it really exciting. It also from uh, the internal perspective, it would be much easier and smooth to uh, to, to evolve language further. So it, it's really also really good news because like the whole uh, the whole design will be like after ten years <laughs> of <laughs> developing, uh, there are, you might so, uh, want to change a lot of things. Let so me like, let me ask you a difficult let me ask you a difficult question. What we can expect in the next three years, two years? How what is the roadmap? Do you look? For a Kotlin uh, roadmap. Uh, we actually, pre uh, where is the link? We <laughs> published the roadmap that you can check. It's a short term roadmap because uh, it's uh, always uh, better to promise something short term because. <laughs> I, I actually, nice. I think I, I had this experience before 1.0 Kotlin release. I went to different conferences and uh, folks were for us like, when Kotlin to be released, I can get here and half. And then like more, a, a couple of years passed and it's like, mm, probably I just, it's better never to give any dates <laughs> because our life is more complicated and something can go wrong. But uh, in this roadmap, you, you can check uh, what is, um, what is there, what we're work, working on, and also share your opinion on different features because there are always links to user issues. We also gather feedbacks in terms of what features you like. We look at votes in UTRAC, there are, uh, there, uh, you can vote for the issue, and we see, like, okay, 400 people voted for this issue, probably it's really important. So let's 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 investigate, let's look deep, deeper on it. So you, you, you really can all uh, take part into, 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 into this. Um, I have one more minute uh, to ask one more question. It's related to a game developer enthusiast who is asking, is there anything that JetBrains or a Kotlin is coming up with for a game developer support? Uh, nothing 
specifically chat brains are doing uh, or Kotlin specifically, but you can you can check, for instance, libgdx uh, and uh, other um, um, other projects uh, that are there. Libgdx, I think there are e courses and uh, there are Kotlin Conf talks. So there are like many many things I will also share the link. But uh, in uh, in general, again, like we have this mantra, everything the proxy for Java. <laughs> Works for Kotlin because it's just because of this uh, reusing of uh, full power of uh, Java ecosystem, and that Great. includes everything for cool. game development. So now uh, we will conclude our uh, today's event and session. Uh, it was great discussion. Uh, thank you, panelists, for sharing your insights. Uh, I'm sure our audience would have turned more informed after this one hour of interaction. Um, Kotlin lovers, audience on YouTube, on the stream, uh, stay tuned for our next session, which is coming soon. Uh, we shall be addressing all of you with how and why to move from Java to Kotlin. Uh, this session will be taken by our Kotlin expert, uh, Sarthak from ThoughtWorks. Uh, we will also invite a very well-known name from the industry to share their experience in migrating to Kotlin. So thank you, folks, uh, for joining today in, on Saturday afternoon. Um, and thank you, panelists, for your valuable time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.